if you're concerned and you don't feel comfortable talking to your doctor, you might need to get another doctor, okay? Because that's the whole point we need to listen. And if you feel that you're not being listened to, you may need to consider getting another another doctor because no one knows your body like you do. Welcome to The Doctor Will Hear You Now, a podcast featuring our physicians and other healthcare providers telling their stories, sharing glimpses into their daily work and mission, and showing what it means to practice medicine just a little bit differently. Healing you means hearing you. So let's talk. I'm Ben. And I'm Lexi. And today we're welcoming Dr. Carol Payne, an OBGYN at Our Lady of the Angels Hospital in Vocalusa, to talk about women's health, the role that hormones play, and the importance of listening to women's voices in healthcare. Welcome, Dr. Payne. Thank you so much for joining us today on The Doctor Will Hear You Now. Can you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and your work with Our Lady of the Angels? Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you, Benjamin and Lexi, for inviting me here to join you. I'm an original Louisianian, born and bred here in Beverage, Louisiana. Uh, but I've spent the majority of my professional career in Atlanta, Georgia, where I've practiced for the past 20 years. Recently started a family, decided to come home and have my children experience all that Southern Louisiana has to offer. I'm an OBGYN, as you mentioned before, and my passion is helping women throughout all stages of their lives, from the beginning of their reproductive years, through children, if they choose to have them or not, up until menopause and that lovely time afterwards where women really get to enjoy all the fruits of their labor. That is why I came back home. That's great. That's wonderful. Yeah. So now our health system has made the promise to listen to our patients, to sit beside them, to understand their stories and be full partners in their health. We know that women's health issues can be incredibly personal for the patient. So was wondering for you, what role does listening play in your work providing health care for women, particularly in maternity care? Listening is paramount in women's health. As you said, this is a very personal part of a woman's life in maternity care. And even in gynecological care, it is something that not only do you have to have technical expertise, but you have to have an interpersonal expertise. My goal is to be your advocate. Your body is the greatest gift that you have ever been given. And ultimately, how, what you do with it, I can only guide you. Those decisions are ultimately made by you. So my job is to guide you through those decisions, to let you know the good and the bad of what you, what you want to do. And those options may not be the options that I would choose, but those options are your options. So listening is key, how you approach your labor experience, how you approach your pregnancy experience, how you approach those first moments after the baby is born are all highly personal and highly variable. My job is to make it as safe and as comfortable for you, your newborn, if you are pregnant, or your loved ones and family as I can. That's great. And I think one of the the big topics we really wanted to connect with you on is is hormone health and how even listening plays a big role in that, listening to your own body, going to a provider that you know will listen to you. And I feel like it's a topic that is just, it's all over social media, TikTok, Instagram, there's videos on balancing your hormones and how imbalancing your hormones affects, you know, your health and your fertility and just all of the stages of your life as a woman. And so some of it seems like it is true. And some of it seems like maybe that's not, you know, real in, in what you see out there. And so just coming to you as the expert is, can you give us an overview of, of the role that hormones play in, in our health as women? And just how does that change over time? Oh, of course. Well, as you said, hormones affect us throughout our entire lives from birth to death. And I had you know, as as your parents would say, if I had a nickel for every time somebody asked me, you know, about this, I'd be a very rich person. And it's true. And there are a lot of misconceptions out there. The biggest thing I would like patients to understand is, number one, if you have a question, ask me. Uh, Just because it's published 
doesn't make it true. <laughs> and uh, a, a lot of things that you will see on TikTok and the internet will have a kernel of truth. And then they will expound it to something to where I can't even recognize it by the end. Good rule of thumb is that if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. But definitely please ask your physician. At different stages of a young woman's life, before she enters puberty, he, her ovaries are still working, okay? They're still producing estrogen and congestin, even though she has, doesn't have breasts or hasn't had a period. During that phase, they're pretty quiet. And they're just helping that child grow, develop bones, develop bone maturity is what we call that, develop her height, her weight. All of that is actually regulated by your hormones, okay? And it's not just your ovaries, but it's also your thyroid. It's also your adrenal glands. So the first thing I would like people to understand is that hormones cover everything, not just what's in your pelvis. Once a young lady enters puberty, that's when those ovaries really start to rev up. And that's when we worry about if you don't start your menses on time, are we setting yourself up for osteoporosis later or infertility later? Also, if you started too early, are we setting you up for decreased bone mass? Are we setting you up for psychological issues for developing breast earlier to where you get unwanted attention? And that could actually lead to issues with school development, with intellectual development, intellectual achievement. We know young girls can have issues with that when they go through puberty too early. So those are issues we think about in that adolescent phase. Well, as we get to the reproductive phase, well, yeah, now we're talking about whether you can have a baby, the difficulty in having a child or getting pregnant and staying pregnant. Those are all of different phases of your life. Then menopausal, why am I still having a period? When will it go away? <laughs> when is this part of my life over? At each stage of our line, our hormones are designed to do a different thing. I don't like to use the phrase hormonal balance because they're never really balanced, okay? At any stage of our line, you're going to have more of one hormone than another. And depending on what is more or less will depend on what your symptoms are. Once you tell me your symptoms, I can then kind of regulate to figure out how to get them back into their proper ratios but they're never going to be completely balanced, okay? You're, you're always going to have a little bit more of this and a little bit less of that because that's what it's supposed to be. But the issue is if you feel that you're tipping too far one way or the other, I could kind of help to make that ratio better for you, depending on where you are in the stage of your life. That was actually a question I kind of wanted to ask you about when it comes to balance or imbalance. First off, is it something that you might see more often in older women? Like, does it happen across the course of their lives that these imbalances might happen? We do happen to see that a lot of women will first notice it when they're older Mm -hmm. because they're now finally talking to their peers and realize that everyone doesn't feel like they do. But when I talk to these women when they're older, They tend to tell me that they've had these issues their entire life, but just never told their mom or their grandma, or they never really talked to their friends about it because it's something that they just didn't do. So one good thing about social media and TikTok is that I'm discovering a lot of these issues earlier because young women these days will talk to their peers about it. Sometimes they don't talk to me, but they're talking to somebody. And so they figure out, that, hey, this isn't right, or why has this happened to me and it's not happening to Sally and it's not happening, you know, to Josephine, as opposed to my older women, they are just now figuring out that maybe they've been suffering from hypothyroidism for the past 30 years, and but they never knew it because they thought everybody only had a period once every 12 weeks, or they thought everybody sweated through their pajamas at night and they never because they didn't talk about that with their mom and they didn't talk about that with their friends and so they finally saw the talk show where they said you don't have to go through that it happens at each stage of life but our more mature ladies now are just now discovering that it may not be normal and so what are i guess some common treatments that you might advise when it comes to that to the balance situation? 
Sure. For my younger ladies, it really depends on what they, uh, what their symptoms are. You know, if they are having issues with periods, which is usually what most people have issues with hormonal regulation in the childbearing years, there are definitely lots of things we can do as far as sometimes even changing your diet or exercise can do it. And there are definitely medications that I can prescribe that are not hormonal that can control that hormonal issue. As we get older, we can do hormone replacement therapy. And, but there are also other things we can do other than hormone replacement therapy, depending on what your issue is. For example, if you have hot flashes, some natural remedies are not pharmaceutical remedies are things like black cohosh, things like certain soy in your diet. Okay. Even certain antidepressants like Effexor can help with those hot flashes that you're experiencing. If you're having problems going to sleep, we can do other medications that help with sleep that can be caused by differences in your estrogen or progestin levels. One thing you said that really caught my attention was you talked about different things you can do with diet and exercise. I know that that's out cycle thinking is really, you know, like what's hit the waves on social media and just how you can eat certain foods during different phases of the cycle. And so does food and just what we put in our bodies really impact our cycles and our hormones that much? Yes. One thing that we have discovered recently is that one of the big buzz phrases now on social media is something called PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome. One of the things that the ovaries actually help us do is regulate our blood sugar, okay? So some women are naturally a little bit more insulin resistant, meaning they walk around with a higher blood sugar, even if they're not eating a lot of overly sugared foods. So there is a thought called a fertility diet or a PCOS diet, where you lower the amount of carbohydrates that you eat in relation to your protein meaning your carbohydrate load is about 30% of your full diet. And that can actually help regulate that ovarian production of insulin growth relating factor. That in turn can actually make your ovulation more regular. So yes, what we eat definitely has an effect on how our ovaries work and can have an effect on our ovulation. I've had ladies who've actually gone from not being able to conceive to having better luck with conception just by changing their diet, sometimes by building their muscle mass, which also helps lower your blood sugar levels as well. That's awesome that, you know, there is some control over that and that when you pay attention to what what you eat and you can put in your body really helps to manage those symptoms. In the same kind of note, there are so many misconceptions and myths out there. Are there any that you want to debunk that you want our audience to know, you know, this is completely myth, don't believe it, or come and see me and I'll talk you through the truth. Any that you'd want to put out there to, to kind of clear the air? My biggest thing is that food is medicine, okay? And that there is no totally good food and there's no totally bad food. Everything is in moderation. Anybody tells you you should only eat cabbage and you can never eat bread, or you should only eat cheese and sausage and, and, you know, and never eat rice. No, no, none of that works. Our bodies were not meant to work that way. Everything is in moderation and everything is individualized to a particular person. Okay. One person can eat pasta and rice all day and lose 15 pounds. Another person can eat pasta and rice all day and gain 20. I personally am that second person. Okay. <laughs> I, I, so the struggle is real. I, I, I struggle right there with you. The key is to figure out what works for you. So if there's nothing else you remember from this today is that medicine is individualized to the person. And that includes what you eat. That includes what you do with your body. It includes all of that. So nutrition, food, rest, stress relief. All of those are as important as anything I can give you in a medicine bottle. And um, all of that needs to work together for your best health. That's great advice. So it, it really is. You can't always listen to the influencer on your TikTok. <laughs> it's better to go get your own personalized care from a doctor. 
to make sure that it fits you specifically. Yeah, that's great. Yes, please. And what's funny is that a lot of the personal influencers on TikTok have their own doctors. <laughs> okay. Uh, they're usually not just not just treating treating themselves. But the key is, is that what's most important is what you do the 90% of the time that you're not in my office. I can guide you. Those decisions you have to make on your own. But again, what you put in your body to eat, how much you're sleeping, if you're exercising, all of those things have a huge, huge, huge impact on your health not just the medicines that I take. And I think you've you've kind of touched on this. Just want to make sure if, if there are any other ways that you see for a woman to be in tune with her body and her health and how you advise your patients to just listen to their bodies. It depends on the, the age of the woman. Some basic guidelines are if you have every woman should basically start their menses by 16. If you haven't started your period by 16 or 17, that's a sign that maybe you need to come in and be seen by a pediatrician or a gynecologist is when we typically start seeing you. Once we get past 21 or 22, some things that you need to look for is that your menses should be regular. It doesn't have to be every calendar month, okay? Your body doesn't follow the Gregorian calendar, but you should be having a period at least every 30, every 28 to about 30, 40 days. If you're not having a period that regularly, that's a sign that we need to be checked out. Or if you're bleeding pretty heavily every two weeks, that's another sign that you need to be checked out. If you're older or even if you're within your reproductive age, if you're sweating profusely at night where you're having to change your bed clothes, come and see me. If you're not able to sleep, if you cannot fall asleep, that can be a sign of a hormonal issue as well. Also, if you're losing or gaining a lot of weight without trying, if all of a sudden you've lost 20 pounds and you haven't changed how you're eating or exercising, that can be a hormonal imbalance as well as vice versa. Now, we just got on Mardi Gras, so we put on some weight on Mardi Gras. That probably isn't hormonal, okay? But if it's a non-Mardi Gras season and you've noticed that you've gained a lot of weight or especially a lot of tummy weight and nothing else, that could be a sign of a hormonal issue as well. And then also, if you're very irritable, if you're just cannot be consoled, always angry or always very sad, those could also be signs of hormonal issues no matter what your age is. I know women have all kinds of different pain tolerances and sometimes you're like, well, it's not, I don't think it's that bad or... I don't want to go to the doctor and worry them or I don't even think it's worth going to the doctor or they may have second thoughts of, is this pain really bad? Is it not? What would you say to those women? Would you rather them always just come in to be sure or trust their gut or should they be nervous about coming in if they're unsure? It's always safe to just get it checked out no matter what. I would rather you come and see me and I tell you everything's fine than for you to sit at home and worry. Okay, so it's always better for it to be examined. But more importantly, if you're concerned and you don't feel comfortable talking to your doctor, you might need to get another doctor. Okay, because that's the whole point of this podcast is that we need to listen. And if you feel that you're not being listened to, you may need to consider getting another another doctor. Okay, because no one knows your body like you do. So if you feel something is wrong, you have a right to get that investigated and checked out. And if you don't feel that you're being heard or that you're being respected, you have a right to find another physician. And it, in a similar note, I mean, women's voices belong at the center of healthcare, And like you're saying, sometimes that's not always the case and they don't always feel that way with the doctors that they see. And so can you talk a little bit about how that comes in play with the patients that you work with and as yourself, a woman working in healthcare? Women tend to be the caretakers. So we tend to put everyone else's needs first. But when you step into my office, I stress that this is your time. So this is your time to be selfish if you center on yourself. And even if you feel that you're not being heard, Reiterate what you want to address, okay? 
when you come in to see your physician, write down a list. Coming to the doctor's office is very nerve wracking. Even I forget. So if you don't have a support person with you, write down a list of the things that you want to hit. Make sure that you're sitting down and that you're calm and that you can express yourself. A lot of my patients get in and they say, oh, I know you're in a hurry and I know you're busy. Well, that may be the case, but this is your time. So take a breath, exhale, and follow your list of what needs to be said. Okay. And be the squeaky wheel. Okay. You are your own best advocate. And if it's not being addressed, make sure it's addressed again and again and again, because you know your body, but you just have to be forceful. And sometimes we as women have a problem doing that. So just have your list, have your plan and say, you know, doc, I really want to get this checked out. What can we do to check this out? How do you in, in that same theme, I guess, how do you as a doctor empower the women who come to see you to to speak up and, and ask those questions about their care? The easiest way I do that is actually by being quiet. If you stop and listen, most patients inherently know what's going on with them and they inherently want to tell you, but often feel that they don't have a chance to speak. When I was training, I was taught to come in and sit down and just not talk for five minutes. And five minutes is a long time. That's a very long time. But if you can say hello and just look at them and not speak for two to three minutes, that typically is enough time for a patient to feel heard and to really get out all of their concerns. After that, I try to give them objective information. Here's a handout on what I think you have, you know, here's a handout on premature menopause or here's a handout on irregular periods so that you have something that you leave with that you can read about because you're going to forget some of the things I say. That's just human nature. And then also having them follow up with me. Okay, come back and see me in six weeks. We can readdress it and see what happens after that. And are there any other questions that you might have wished that your patients might have asked more? or come to you more often for? The biggest thing I wish my patients would come to me for more often is when they feel something isn't right. Do not wait. Don't chalk it up to, oh, oh, you know, that's probably just gas or, oh, that's nothing. If the common things don't work, come and see me. Okay, if you're feeling bloated, if you're feeling gassy, if you take the gas X and if you, you know, do all the things your mama told you, you, you know, you eat the fiber and you're still bloated and gassy, you still don't feel good, come see me, okay? Common things are cured commonly, but if the common things don't work, it's always better to come see me sooner rather than later. And get your screens, get your screens, get your mammogram, get your colonoscopies, please get your pap smears. That's the other thing, get it done. You know, if you don't have the insurance or if you don't have the money, call. We can find different programs that will cover you to get those screens. Those really do save lives. And I've seen too many things that have gone too long because they're scared because they don't have the, the money or the resources. If I can't do it, I will try to find somebody who can. I can tell that you're a great advocate for your patients and just health in general, especially for women. Um, and so it's so refreshing to hear because it's unfortunately not always the case. Is there anything that we might have missed? Anything that you wanted to share that you wanted to make sure that listeners know? For women, it's the whole gamut and not to be scared to talk about, you know, marital relations and things like that with your provider. The younger generation has no problem with it. Uh, but but some, some of my older, some of my older ladies are still very, very, very hesitant about that. And not to be scared of the change. It's natural. We can make it uh, more comfortable. You don't have to feel like, you know, you're losing your femininity, that it's a completely natural part of your life. Last question for you is, what are you most excited about in the future of healthcare for women? I'm most excited about the fact that we are recognizing that women are not just men who have babies, okay? That women's health includes all of the woman's health, not just what happens with your uterus tubes and ovaries. I'm excited that we are recognizing 
that heart disease affects women differently. I'm excited that we're realizing that your thyroid is part of your hormones and not just your ovaries. I'm excited that we're having more women in orthopedics and cardiology and pulmonology because we are different. And um, the differences are not just when you're having a period. The differences are before puberty. The differences are after menopause. And I'm excited that we are seeing that these things are different in women and that we're doing research to see how we can help women survive heart attacks and how we can diagnose heart attacks in women and fix kidney disease and all of that things. Because typically most of medicine has always been based on men. And it's mostly been based on men in their 40s who are Caucasian. And that's not the majority of the world. So it's exciting for me to see Women's Heart Health Month and to see, you know, women's arthritis walks and, you know, that the only thing is not just a breast cancer walk. Because breast cancer is important, but lung cancer is still the number one killer of women. So to see me that we're recognizing that we are different and that we're making great strides in all areas. Thank you again for joining us, Dr. Payne. And thank you for having me. It was my pleasure. And listeners, thanks for tuning in. We'll have other helpful resources linked in the show notes. And we'll be back soon with more episodes of The Doctor Will Hear You Now, a podcast from Franciscan Missionaries of Our Lady Health System. And if you have ideas for topics that you'd like to hear about on the show, we're happy to cover them. Email us at podcast at fmolhs.org. Thanks for listening.